We started talking about <coughs> on New Year's Eve service, and we didn't we did not finish. But we started talking about how the um, you know we always have a word for the year and that kind of stuff, and you know you know twenty more in two thousand and four, or you know um, things are going to be in two thousand and three, or you know you know. Um, Lots to do in 2002. I mean, just everybody has these rhymes. But, we, we, but the thing is, when you get to, you know, 2013, 2014, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, they're all, they're all around with teen. So, you know, do you really have a word? You're just making up stuff that rhymes. And really, the Lord had impressed upon me, and, and I'm, I'm not against having a word for the year. Don't, don't take me wrong. Um, but the Lord impressed upon me that his desire is for people to become more consistent. To be steadfast in their, in their everyday, consistent daily walk. And instead of running from word to word or, or from, you know, and, and, and don't think I'm demeaning the, 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 uh, the anointing of the Holy Spirit to speak things that encourage people. But a lot of times what we've done, we've, it's just like uh, other areas of life. People could become dependent upon a special this or a special that instead of doing what the Bible says to do. Thank God for the special times of refreshing or the special words, uh, those things that God does do. Um, but when we become dependent upon that, when we start seeking for that and start searching for that, and that becomes how we live. We live from, we live from special word to special word instead of from line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. Amen. Amen. Going from glory to glory, walking in the light of the word, uh, then, then we're not growing. Okay. <clears throat> um, you know, we're always having to come up with a new way to get people inspired. And I think we should live an inspired life. Our life should be inspired because Jesus is Lord. Jesus is our Lord. The Holy Ghost is on the inside of us. And um, so we began talking about um, the, the verse, James 1.12, that says, Blessed is the man that endureth. Temptation for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised for them that love him. And how the word, we've taught this before, it's nothing new, but uh, the word endureth comes from the Greek hupomeno. Um, and, and I may or may not be pronouncing that correctly, but you know, we'll all get away. H U um, P O M E N O, hupomeno. And it just seems that's the way we pronounce it to me. <clears throat> and um, it means to remain, or not, uh, to remain, to tarry behind, not to recede or to flee, um, to per persevere under misfortunes and trials, um, to endure. And so, uh, uh, Weist, in his translation of James 1.12, says it kind of basically this way. He says, he that remains steadfast when he is tried shall receive the crown of life. And so steadfastness, stability, is, it should be a part of the character of the New Testament believer. It should be something that we're consistent in. We shouldn't be floating, you know, oh, this was, you know, 2013 was a bad year. Well, you know, listen, do you know you're going to have bad years, bad things, seasons of, of life? Excuse me. Hallelujah. Nathan, how about not put me out in the, the, the ozone layer again? Boy, can play, he gets playing that guitar like that, and I just kind of go, ooh, hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah, I love, to, I love to hear an acoustic guitar anyway. Praise the Lord. Um, our lives should be that of, of a, a, that demonstrate a steadfastness, a consistency, that we're not going, oh, man, 2013 was a bad year because this happened politically, and that happened here, and this happened over there, and you know, listen, things happen. Things are going to continue to happen. Things are going to happen around you in 2014. Now, if you think just because the calendar year changed last uh, Monday night, Tuesday night, at, uh, or last Tuesday night at midnight, and we went into a whole new year, and everything's going to be hunky door in your life, that's the problem we're talking about. See, so you, could, you, could you could have had victory all 2013, and you can have 20, uh, victory out of 2014. But you can have trials, trouble, and tribulation, and defeat. And the, you know, you say, well, man, man, I'm glad 2013 is over because it was a rotten year. Well, I'm going to tell you something. Unless you do certain things, 2014 is going to be a rotten year. 
The rotten year didn't stop just because the calendar changed. Rotten years or rotten seasons stop because you lay hold of the Word of God. You begin to live a consistent Christian lifestyle. You live in the Word. You live under the anointing. You do the things the Word says to do. You're steadfast in your life. Amen. They don't stop being rotten because the calendar year changed. I mean, what, what you, you look at the Chinese New Year, the year of the, you know, the, year of the, the rotten tomato or something? I don't know. And you're going to have a rotten year because of that? And how many remember that, uh, that woman, um, uh, Jean something? No, Jean, not Jean Wilkerson was a prophetess. Dixon. Everybody used to listen and read her stuff in, in, in the magazines every year to see what the year was going to be like. And she was wrong like 80% of the time. Now, I've got to ask a question for you. Why are you going to base your daily life on the predictions of a demon-inspired false prophetess who's got a track record of 80% wrong? And you're going to go, oh, Lord, it's going to be a terrible year because Gene Dixon said so. No. <clears throat> My years are not based on what people like that say. Amen. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even my faith. And so I'm going to live out of faith and the word of God. Can you say amen? Um, <coughs> Vine says that hupomino means to abide under, to bear up courageously. Amen. It's also translated patient. You take it patiently. Um, you know, it, 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 we see the word suffer sometimes. If you suffer things, it's how, in, in some cases that word is hupomino in the Greek doesn't mean that, you, you know, you suffer, you get sick, you're dying. You're, it means you're steadfast. Okay? So, uh, we start, we last week we talked about how you're going, to, you're going to face afflictions. We had a number of scriptures about that. And, and um, 1 Peter 5, 9, talk about, the, you know, the devil and says, Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. We kind of left off there saying, you're not the only one. If you're going through a tough time, don't think you're the only one. Stop singing the gloom, despair, he's all song. Stop singing, you know, nobody likes me, everybody hates me, think I'll eat the worms song. I remember that as a kid. Nobody likes me, everybody hates me. Think That's the dumbest thing you want to do. If nobody likes you, everybody hates you. That won't help anybody like you any better. Because if, if you want the girls to like you, and you're singing that song, and you're eating the worms, they're just going to go, ew, and that's it. They're all gone. Um. But it's not how well we do when no pressure is on us that counts in life. It's how we respond when the evil day comes. Amen? <clears throat> Whether that day is a season or a day, we cannot waver, but we must remain steadfast. Jesus said in Matthew uh, 24, 13, He that shall endure to the end, again, he, he, you know, remain steadfast, should, the same shall be saved. Uh, our, your, your life is daily tested with stuff. Now, depending on how, you know, some people say, they got up on the wrong side of the bed, which usually means they're having a rough day and they're not handling it real well. But the next day, you got up on the different, if you roll across and get up on a different side of the bed and have a better day, had nothing to do with what side of the bed you got out of. It's how, you, it's the attitude with which you arose with. It's the way you decided to deal with it. Amen. You can either deal with it good or you can deal with it bad. Uh, Romans 12 tells us we're to be rejoicing in hope, patient or steadfast in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. See, when tribulation comes, are you going to be who you are um, when tribulation isn't there? Or are you going to be somebody different? That's a big question. Love, according to 1 Corinthians 13, 7, says, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, or remains steadfast in all things. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 10 through 12, Paul wrote and said, Therefore I endure or remain steadfast in all things for the elect's sake, that they may obtain the salvation which is Christ Jesus with eternal, which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer or remain steadfast, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he, will also, he also will deny us. Um, and then for Hebrews 10, 32, 
But call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured or remained steadfast in a great fight of afflictions. And then we went on a read last week and got down to Philippians 4, 11 to 13, where Paul talks about how that he knows how to be abased and how to abound. And how that, you know, there's a, there's a commentary on that that says, Paul said, I know how to abase, be abased and not lose my poise. I know how to abound and not lose my head. There's a lot of Christians who go through life just waiting for their ship to come in, as it were, with their faith. And when it shows up, they get on it and sail away. They lose their poise. They lose, I mean, they lose their head. They get so caught up with their prosperity and their success, they forget about continuing to serve God. I can tell you something. It's not a, not a wise move. You go sailing your ship away on, you know, and just, I'm, well, I don't need to go to church anymore. I, you know, why do I need to go to church? Why do I need to go hear the preacher preach? I got, my, I got mine. Well, see, that, that's the, just the wrong attitude. Old Pentecostals used to do this. We would tarry for the Holy Ghost. I say, well, yeah, I grew up Pentecostal, classical Pentecostal church. And, uh, you know, people tarry for the Holy Ghost. You'd have some folks, I knew one guy had been tarrying for 15 years. Probably upset with me, I got it two days after I got saved. I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He'd been tarrying for 15 years. I mean, I was, I was with him at the altar one night, just a young kid, just got born again, filled with the Holy Spirit. Boy, I, you know, I'm on fire for God. He's down there, they're trying to get him filled with the Holy Ghost, slapping him on the back. Got the, had an upright piano, you know, the upright pianist. It had the lid of it, you know, the, you can let it raise those up to like a gram, but just a, put this thing under it. And they're just banging on the piano. And, you know, and they're slapping them. One guy's jaw is going on this thing, you know, shout hallelujah. Somebody's saying, let go. Somebody out shaking and saying, shout praise the Lord. Somebody else on the side shaking saying, shout glory to God. <laughs> hallelujah. Are you here? But a lot of times you, you get people like that, and they, you know, they tarry for years and years. Finally, they get filled with the Holy Ghost, and the next church service, they wouldn't even be there. So I say, hey, we missed you last week. Well, didn't you hear? Hear what? I got it. Got what? I got the baptism. So they got it mixed up. Getting, Jesus told them to tarry until they be able to do with power from a high so they can be effective. He didn't say tarry and then quit. Amen? And a lot of times we do that with the church. We, we lose our consistency because we, we get to a certain place, we achieve a certain level of success, of, you know, whatever, and then all of a sudden, we let that success go to our head, and we just kind of go, see, Paul said, I know how to be, a, to be abased and not lose my poise. See, people can go all to pieces if they don't have enough. See, if you live by faith, you learn how not to go all to pieces. And you know how to have too much or abound and not lose your head. Amen? Not, not, not lose sight of what your, what, what all, all, what your walk is all about. All right. Paul even wrote in, in the 20th century New Testament translation um, of Philippians 4.11. King James says, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned that whatsoever state I am, therein to be to content. Um, 20th century New Testament says, I've, For I, however I am placed, have learned to be independent of the circumstances. See, the consistent, steadfast lifestyle is not governed by what's going on around it. It's governed by a relationship and walk with the Lord that is independent of the circumstances surrounding it. In other words, your joy is not based on, I got enough money in the bank, or your sadness, because I don't have enough money in the bank. You've learned by walking with the Lord to be independent of those circumstances. You're steadfast, you're consistent. God's looking for steadfast believers. Say, God's looking for steadfast believers. Okay. 2 Peter 1, uh, verses 1 through 10. Uh, I need to read this. Um, I may, may not read the whole thing out of both translations, but we'll, we'll do King Jimmy first. Uh, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. That by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. Let's stop there for a second. 
How are you going to be partakers of the divine nature? Through the exceeding great and precious promises. Amen? His, his written word, glory to God. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And besides this, give all diligence. Add to your faith virtue, and to your virtue, and to virtue knowledge, to knowledge temperance, to temperance patience, to patience godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. That is, add to godliness phileo, and to phileo uh, agape. For if these things be in you and abound, they make, they make you that you shall neither be barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind, cannot see afar off, has forgotten that he was purged from his own old sins. Wherefore, brother, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you shall never fall. Let me read this to you out of the uh, Weymouth translation. I just like the way he says a couple of things in here, and, and um, so instead of just cherry picking through it, I'll just read the whole passage. Simon Peter, a bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have been allotted the same precious faith as that which is ours through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. May more and more grace and peace be granted to you in a full knowledge. And that, that word knowledge there, because he says full knowledge, comes from epinosis, which means a clear, precise, exact, full knowledge. Okay? And even, even to the point of experientially, experientially knowing this. Not head knowledge. Not that you read it, you memorized it. So you can memorize stuff and then don't do you any good. Setting things to memory, or you know, setting scripture to memory is good, but not living it um, thwarts the benefit of memorization. You have to live what you memorize, what you feed on. Okay? The knowledge can't just be a head knowledge. Well, I, can, I, can, I know what 50, 50 words in the Greek mean. Yeah, but do you know what, the, have you experienced the, what it means in those things, not just a definition of something? Now, the one, you know, there's a, there's a Greek, uh, com, Greek translator and commentator, very well versed in the, in the Greek, but he said things like he called the Christian the believing sinner. And that's not, that's not even biblical. Does great job. See, he does a great job with the Greek as far as what the Greek meanings of words are. He just formulated a, a, a belief system. You could hear things and formulate a belief system without walking in the full light. So <clears throat> here he says that he wants us to come to a full knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. Seeing that his divine power has given us all things that are needful for life and godliness through, through our knowledge of him. Now they're there but they come to you through the knowledge of him. Uh, epinosis knowledge. A clear, precise, exact, experiential knowledge of him. Amen? How many of you have ever, you ever, ever been asked if you know someone? Hey, you know so-and-so? Well, in, in slang vernacular, you've met them? Yeah, I know them. But in... in, 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 in um, strict interpretation of the word know, do you really know them? Do you know their likes, their wants, the, the, the things they want to do in life? Do, or have you been, you know, really what you're trying to say is when you, in that kind of casual way, I've been, I've been acquainted with them. I don't know them. I'm, I'm acquainted with them. I've been introduced to them. We've talked before. But I don't know them. See, we're not talking about being acquainted with the Lord Jesus. We're not talking about being acquainted with God. We're talking about coming to know him. Amen? Coming into that clear and precise and exact experiential knowledge of who God is. Amen. And, the, you know, and here he says that he's given us all things that are needful for life and godliness through the knowledge. Amen? Of him who has appealed to, uh, who, who has appealed to us by his own glorious... Um, perfections. It is by means of these that he's granted us his precious and wonderful promises in order that through them you may one and all become sharers in the very nature of God, of God, having completely escaped the corruption which exists in the world through earthly cravings. But for this very reason, adding on your part all earnestness along with your faith manifest also a noble character. Along with a noble character, 
knowledge, along with knowledge, self-control. With self-control, power of endurance. That's one of the things we're after. God wants us to have endurance. Amen? Along with power of endurance, godliness. Along with godliness, brotherly affection. And along with brotherly affection, love. And that's what we talked about earlier. I said, I said phileo and agape. Um, phileo, which is where we get the root word for Philadelphia. Called the city of brotherly love. I'm not sure if it still is or not, but that's what it was called. It came from the Greek phileo. Okay? Philly, phileo. Meaning brotherly love. But the love that God talks about and Jesus talked about in 1 Corinthians 13, or Paul talked about 13, and, when, and God so loved the world, is agape, unconditional love, okay? The love of God. Now, if these things be in you, or if all these things exist in you, and continually increase, they prevent your being either idle or unfruitful in advancing towards a full knowledge of our Lord Jesus. For the man whom these are lacking is blind, cannot see distant objects, in that he has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his old sins. For this reason, brethren, be all the more in earnest to make sure that God has called you, chosen you, for it is certain that as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. So Peter here is giving us an, an, an admonition to do something about our growth in the Lord. That's, that comes from consistency. The people who, who, who actually believe, you know, I get saved, I don't, need to, I don't need to go to church, I don't need to feed, I don't need to study, I don't need to do it. I just, I just sit down and lay around and look at the finished work of Jesus because I'm under grace. Some of that Looney Tune stuff, you know. And they all just, you know, just kind of run around, ooh, this is wonderful. Um, what if we taught you that when your children get born, just lay them in the crib, they're going to grow because they're humans. They would not grow, would they? You have to nurture them. They have to be nurtured. They have to be fed. They have to be fed the right stuff. Now look, strained peas are all right when they're at a certain age. Please don't bring them for me now. Amen? I mean, you know, how many remember when you, when you were feeding your kids and you, know, you open that little Gerber jar and you're thinking, oh. And the kids are going, I mean, it's all over the place. Jess used to get it up her nose. I mean, I, I just everywhere. You can't get her to touch a garden pea now. She used to, used to cram them up her nose. She, you know, and she loved Gerber. I think more than any of the other kids. Just like these times as a parent when you really just get to tell off on your kids and, and embarrass them completely. But Peter tells us to give all diligence to do something about our growth. Um, don't blame circumstances, life, or other people for why you're not where you want to be. Just, just go ahead and grow. Grow through it. Grow through the tough... The, I said turn the heat off. I did not say turn the air conditioning on, son. He was hot and took my, took the, see that's when you take a word and make a dissertation out of it. All I said was the hot, turn the heat off. He heard, you know, go to the air conditioning unit, flip it over from heat to air. Turn, cool, um, <coughs> don't do that with God, for sure. God gives you a word, stay with the word. Don't try to add to it. Um. But rather, you know, be consistently be a doer of the word, do the things necessary to develop consistency and steadfastness in your life. And in that place of steadfastness, um, it will stay you, hold you, undergird you during difficult times. When you're not wavering, when you're not changing, when you're the same. Amen? Now, the Bible tells us not to be any more children. Now, children, now children are... are, are Waver. We were talking about this, you know, about college kids. You know, you can't, you can't, you know, people do studies on college campuses, you know what I'm saying. They'll go do a, they'll do a survey. And college kids will tell you what they think you want to hear or whatever they, the, whatever they think is the coolest, newest thing to be now. Okay? They'll just say whatever. You know, and they'll, they'll try to act real opinionated and really bright and brilliant. And three weeks later, they'll be totally changed. If it takes three weeks. You know, 
Yeah, they're, they're being their own person. Yeah, I, I tell you, I've got a son who's got a grip on that one. You know, a lot of, a lot of people saying that I'm being my own person. They're all being their own person just alike. You know, they're just as much conformed as they're trying to be unconformed. Their unconformity is a conformity to unconformity. All right, that's probably not a right word. Inconformity or whatever the right word is. All right. But, but in, in children, we'll see that they're not steadfast. You know, you, uh, Nathan, now I'm going to tell them Nathan. You want to upset Nathan when he was about four or five years old? Let his ham hot dog bun split on the backside. I'm telling you, it was a crisis in life for his sandwich bun to split on the backside. Like, it tastes the same. See, there you go. It's totally psychologically, I mean, you know, we just, just cry. And you're sitting there thinking, what? It's just, I mean, he just sit there and cry. Couldn't even eat it. Because it tore. I'd have to go get another hot dog bun and transfer everything to the other hot dog bun so he could eat it. Because it was broke. And if that one broke, we were in trouble. Yes, well, I don't know if you know, super glue good for you or not, but. It doesn't take a lot. To, to, un, to get kids, young, younger kids and stuff, to flip from joy to absolute tears in, in seconds. Hello? Now, we used to always do that. When our kids got hurt, we would laugh. And the reason was, if we could get them, if we could get them to start laughing and forget about it, it won't nearly as much as a, of a catastrophe boo-boo as it was when, when they were bawling. And it worked, you know. And if they wouldn't, if they hadn't, if they would not stop crying and kept and not start laughing, we knew they were really hurt. <laughs> but I'm telling you, we would just, oh, <laughs> that's, that's, that's got a boo-boo. And we'd laugh, and they, and they start, ha-ha, <laughs> start laughing. Which, okay, it's over. We don't have a 30-minute cry session over the boo-boo. <clears throat> but kids, I mean, one minute, and see, when, we, when we're Christians and we're unstable, be no more children tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. And see, our, our trouble we get into is, is winds of doctrine. Hello? And it's amazing how you know, people get to a certain age, and if somebody tells them something, they believe it. You know? Well, so-and-so said such and such, and it's the gospel truth. It's like, it's like how many have seen that commercial on television? You know, what are you doing here? I'm waiting for a date. You got a date coming? Yeah, I, I, got, I got an online date. You know, they're, they're French. And, and, and this slob shows up and goes, bonjour. You know, and because it was on the Internet, it had to be true. You know, and, and you know, we need to become consistently steadfast and relationship understanding that the Word of God doesn't change, that just because we're in the 21st century, well, I keep, 21st century now, yeah, um, because we're here, the Word of God no, did not change us and become un, or, or, or irrelevant, that just because we're living in modern times, that the old-fashionedness of a man where it marries a woman, and that's just the way it is, did not become irrelevant because somebody came along and said, we need to be open, you know, we need to be com compassionate. I'm compassionate, you know. Compassion delivers people from sin, not seals them in sin, you know. We got so many things that go around, and go around in teachings and stuff. Got things that go around the church. And those doctrines just float through. And we don't need to be people who run from here and there. We, uh, uh, we used to call them, in back of the charismatic heyday, cruisomatics. 
because they would just cruise from one meeting to another. They were never anywhere. They didn't have a pastor. They didn't have a church. They just went wherever a special meeting was going on. And we got them today. You know, I mean, if, they, if they've got, you know, some guy, that just, they'll, they'll follow this one person around the country. I'm going to tell you, you will never grow just following some preacher around the country. Because the people, guys are going from house to house and place to place aren't pastors. They're traveling ministries. They've got a gift. They've got an anointing. They've got a calling. But it is to aid the local church in its development and, and, and growth of the members. It's not, it's not your steady diet. Hello. Now listen. I love me some cheer wine slushy. And one of the last places in the area that has the metal steel cheer wine slushy, which makes that really fine, fine ice, is over there on Oak, Oak View. Up past Oak View Baptist Church up there on that road and a little gas station up there. And they, they, had, they still had that steel machine. One of the only ones I know of in there. If you know of another one, let me know. I want to find it. I like to mark them down and keep track of them. But you know what you can't do? You can't live on a diet of cheer wine slushy. Now, for all those looking here going who don't live in the North Carolina, South Carolina area, cheer wine is not an alcoholic drink. <laughs> Just so you know. It's a cherry soft drink and uh, cherry soda. And it's, it's, but it's called cheer wine. I don't know why they named it that, but whatever. They, 1912 or something is when they, invent, they, they started producing it down in Salisbury, North Carolina. They call it cheer wine. But they put it in those machines and make a slushy out of it, frozen. Ooh, man, it's good. But you know what? I, can't, I just can't go from everywhere I mark one down and run from store. And that's my breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You've got to have something else besides cheer wine slushy. Now, an occasional one's fine. Occasional one will make you shout. Occasional one will make you go, Woo! Glory to God! Hallelujah! How many of you have never had a cheer wine slushy in your life? Sharon, you hadn't had one? Mr. Huff, have you ever had one? Has your dad ever had one? Now, he's 92 years old. He needs to have a chair wine slushy at least once. <laughs> I mean, he's been around a whole lot of things. He needs a chair wine slushy. Hallelujah. You know, but it'll make you shout. It'll make you glory, glory. I mean, you can just come out going, that's glorious. But you can't live on it. And you got a lot of Christians who want to follow, you know, follow around you. Listen, when Dad Hagen was here, you know, he, he wasn't in the local church. <coughs> he was an aide to the local church. He helped the believer. But you still need pastors. You need your local church. You need, you need a steady diet of other foods and other things. You know, a lot of times we, we, would make our, we would start putting our, making our pastors, uh, demanding our pastors would uh, give us the same diet you were getting at, at the special meeting. Well, that was the purpose of the special meeting, to have the other stuff, and you go out into your, your local church or your pastor and get other things. Amen. Now, we've cooked our last, we made our last dessert for the holidays. And it was this Reese's peanut butter cup chocolate Oreo chocolate pudding doohickey thingy. <laughs> I mean, I can't even speak in English over it. And then we, we Nathan said, uh, Dad, how about bring me up one piece of that stuff? I said, Buddy, it's gone. Yeah, he was, he was, he was up in the bonus room. And we said, Mommy said, you probably didn't want it anymore, so we just finished it off. <coughs> I went to the store and got all the stuff yesterday and made it again so he could get some. The girl said, he's so spoiled. Oh, Cap's just thing. Whew. He must not have got any either. Yeah. But you know what? You can't have the peanut butter Oreo chocolate pudding peanut butter thingy all the time. You can't have, you know, filet mignon every meal. Or you can't have, you know, Nathan, they, 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 Nathan does. In other words... Your diet has to, be, has to be a good, balanced diet. And as Christians, we need to be stable in doctrine and not always going after the, the sugar, going after the dessert. 
Amen? Living on desserts. Always wanting the dessert stuff. Always wanting a Hershey bar. Always wanting, you know, the dessert. Always wanting chocolate-covered cheesecake. Always wanting a cheerwine slushy. And not wanting to eat the good food that you need. Okay? And, and a lot of times what happens in the body of Christ is we get a lot of dessert-type doctrines that everybody just raves over. And we don't stay consistent with simple things like this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that's written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. In other words, you're living in a consistent relationship with the whole counsel of the Word of God, not just one area. Let's face it, folks. Faith is a very vital, important subject of the Bible, a central core subject. But you know what? You better also do some study on walking in love towards people you don't like. Because faith works by love. Amen. You need to do some study on having good godly character. You don't need to make your testimony shipwrecked because of your character. Hello? Do you maintain a godly character? And so we're not going to go into all that, but I just want, you know, just to kind of share. Um, we don't want to be tossed to and fro. Peter, 1 Peter 2.20 says, uh, What glory is it if you, when you're buffeted for your faults, you take it patiently, or you endure it? But if, but if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it or endure that, that is acceptable to God. Now what if you, people are mocking you for, You're preaching living holy in the pulpit, and you're running around with men and women outside, and they're talking about you. That's not being, that's not being uh, talked about wrongly. You know? Number one, you shouldn't be running around with somebody else, whether you're a preacher or not. Hello. We've gotten so flippant with stuff down. Somebody, uh, one, of our, one, of my pastor, one of my pastor friends, his daughter posted something today about that she just read an article about an openly gay Christian minister. Now, what's wrong with that statement? Everything. It doesn't matter if you're openly or secretly. Hello? I don't care. There's no such thing as a gay minister. Oh, yes, there is. No, there's not. I don't care what you say. The Bible is totally, the to totally against what you're saying. But it sounds good, on, you know, then, I, then they call me homophobic. That's a homophobic statement. You know, homophobic means afraid of homosexuals. Yeah. But see, now they just, it's just, but that's become the terminology. If I say something that's not, accept, not, not even just accepting of, of gay or homosexuality, if I don't embrace it and decree it as normal, I'm homophobic. Well, I'm just sorry. You just call me what you want to call me. I'm going to live according to the word. But we, we've got to get back to understanding that we need to live a, a separated, consistent, godly lifestyle. Now, I know people, people come out and they get mad at you when you do because it makes them mad that you're living a certain way. Now, you don't put it in their face and you don't judge them for not living it and tell them, you know, and, and, and beat on them. Now, listen, to tell somebody that homosexuality is wrong is not, condemn, is not being mean. It's telling the truth that you, to save you, to redeem you. In the same way that I would say that pedophilia will send you to hell. Amen? It's not because I hate you. It's because, you know, the love of God constrains me and I demands that I tell you the truth for the salvation of your soul. All right? But as, as believers... Um, Peter says, you're not doing great if you're being buffeted for your faults. You're doing great when you're doing right and you, you're, you're getting buffeted or, or condemned or criticized for it. And a lot of people who want to preach on righteousness, and, I mean not righteousness, holiness and character and right living are taking a beating today. Amen? The love of God does not say keep doing what you're doing. 
That's, that's the misnomer. All right. So we're going to come to the point of being what? Consistent, stable. James 1, 6, 8, 3. Here, we're going to finish right here. Um, but let him ask in faith. If any man lacks anything, let him ask in faith. Nothing wavering, if any man lacks wisdom. Uh, let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like the wind of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. That's why the Lord wants us to be consistent. Can you say amen? All right.